well, my job is just to turn it over to other people so and introduce them and so I'm happy to do that but good to see everyone here and I was just thinking as Roger talked when he talked about one of the purposes of the Free Grace Alliance is to connect people together let me ask this question how many of you through the facilitation of the Free Grace Alliance in some way have partnered with in some way someone else in this room in ministry let's see your hands I would say that's at least half of the group and we like to think that we facilitate that what the Free Grace Alliance does is not always visible because we don't have missionaries we don't have uh, we're not a mission board uh, we don't we're not a publishing house but what we do is we bring you together so you can you can partner and know what one another is doing so that's the value of this ministry um, I'm going to introduce uh, what we do before each plenary session is have what we call ministry minutes so that you can get to meet some of the folks who are involved in ministry uh, out on the field we have seven plenary messages that means we have opportunities for seven people to present their ministries we try to be fair so maybe next year you can present yours we wish we could have feature every one of you here um, and we hope that you take the time to get to know one another but our, our first ministry minutes today is uh, from someone who's become a dear friend uh, to me and uh, he is uh, he will he will show how the free grace message has gone literally to the other side of the world Mike Foster is uh, I don't even know what your title is now Mike you can explain all that but Mike was the director of the word of life ministry in the Philippines and uh, Laguna south of Manila they have a huge ministry there how, how many here have been there teaching or in some form or fashion uh, visited the campus or no mic see there's almost more than a half a dozen folks they have a I, I, I can't I'm not gonna tell you what he does he's gonna do that camping ministry Bible Institute but Mike is gonna come and uh, Mike has just stepped down as the director of the camp has mentored a young man who's another excellent director and remains in the role of mentor there um, but for 33 years has served in the Philippines given his life looked at a piece of jungle and saw what it could become and if you and you'll see what it has become it was just a piece of jungle with cobras Mike <laughs> Good to see you. welcome we have snakes bigger than Charlie that's why that's why when Charlie walks around he likes to have a student walk in front of him you know? <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, I, I know I speak for our staff and our director uh, it would be impossible to explain the, the value uh, that the Free Grace Movement have done for our ministry in the Philippines. I emailed our executive director, Don Locke in Scroon Lake, uh, just to make sure that Word of Life is Free Grace in our philosophy and our doctrine and thinking. And he assured me that we are, uh, because you're not sure with huge worldwide ministries what people are thinking or doing, but I know that it has been uh, greatly defined for our ministry in the Philippines because of the teachers who raised their hands. Uh, people like Roger and Charlie and Richard and Dave James that come and teach and shape and form what we are and help us to define it. I know that I, as an evangelist, don't always think in theological terms, but they have helped us to take what we believe and explain it a little bit more clearer in free grace theological terms and we're very thankful for that as Roger explained we are a large ministry actually we have seven ministries uh, we have first of all a camping ministry we are an evangelistic ministry working with young people and we have a camping ministry in two locations one outside of Manila and one on the northern end of Mindanao and this year we will have about 35,000 campers uh, that will come through our ministry to give you an idea of uh, what the scope if we had the time to show you a camping ministry you would be oohed and odd like I am every time I see it out of that grows our our ministries and local churches we have a Bible Club youth ministry uh, that works with uh, the last count that I heard earlier this year is somewhere around 56 57 churches that are using our Bible Club material which begins with a doctrinal study evangelistic training teaching them how to serve in the local church 
And out of that grew our Bible Institute ministry and further evangelism. So what I'm doing here is to present what God is doing in the Philippines and how it is expanding to other countries. We have students from Korea, we have students from uh, Thailand, from Indonesia, uh, we have students that come from Africa, America, and we actually had just a few years ago, we had four Russian girls uh, that came to the Philippines and studied at our Bible Institute. So we have a ministry that is impacting other cultures. And uh, in our ministry at the Bible Institute, we are teaching them to know the Word of God. And what I want to do is show our short video and then talk to you a little bit about our program and then try to throw out a challenge for some of you to come and to teach like Charlie and Richard and uh, Dave James and uh, that these people are doing and coming and helping us. If we could show that video. The Word of Life Bible Institute helps me to gain deeper understanding and knowledge of God's Word during our class discussions through the help of our guest lecturers and our professors. Um, they also help us to apply this word in our lives. Allows us to know God in a deeper level. Stimulates growth through quiet times and dorm devotions and ultimately gives us the opportunity to show God's love to other people through ministry. It's a training of knowing, growing, and most especially showing and applying what we've learned to our daily lifestyle. Our ministries in the SMS program is more on the church ministries. We get to teach the adults, the youth, and sometimes the kids. Personally for me, it is a blessing because I get to see how the Word of God changes their lives. As Charlie said, uh, God gave us a piece of property that was out in the jungle, and through that, uh, and, and God's grace, and so, so many, so many people praying and giving, and work teams from churches coming, and out of that grew, grew this ministry that is impacting an enormous amount of people and churches. A little bit about our program, we are a Bible Institute ministry. I call ourselves a foundational ministry. We have people who come and study at our school that have le very little foundation in Bible knowledge and certainly very little in theological uh, knowledge as well. And what we attempt to do in our first year program is to take them and we follow the philosophy of study, life, ministry. We want to teach them how to read the Word of God. We want to teach them how to study the Word of God. We want to teach them how to explain the Word of God on that level. And they are taken from the beginning of the Bible in Genesis to Revelation in Bible exposition and Bible survey and in uh, covering basic theology as well. And through that, we, we take them into life. What good is the Word of God if you don't apply it to your life? I could tell you stories of parents who have come back and talk to me, pastors who have come back and talked to me about how the Bible Institute have changed that young person who went there. And through that, we teach them community living. They're taught how to wash dishes. They're taught how to mow the grass. They're taught how to shine their shoes and put their shoes in proper place and make their beds. They're taught community living in our life program. We teach them how to live together with other people. 
And out of that goes to the ministry. We teach them how to share the word of God. The Philippines is a country of 100 million people. And the best of my studies and what I've been able to put together, there's about 96 million people who do not know the Lord. And I'm convinced if we're going to win them to Christ, if we're going to make an impact for Jesus Christ, it's going to have to be through young people leading young people to Christ. And that is what we're attempting to do with the Bible Institute is to do that. Our second program that where we're different than other Word of Life ministries around the world and that many years ago I added another program called School of Ministerial Studies. Uh, I have not been happy with what some of the schools have been producing about pastors and churches and God just, uh, I, I really did this uh, on my knees, but God led us to start a ministry within the Bible Institute that would take students who want to go into the ministry and teach them the skills and the knowledge they need to do that. And this is where people like Richard and Charlie and, and Roger and Dave come in. They not only teach the courses, expositional courses in the first year program, School of Biblical Studies, but they also teach a lot of the how-tos, how to study. Uh, we have Greek, we have Hebrew, they learn music, they learn how to preach, they learn how to teach. They learn how to marry and how to bury. Uh, just past year, we had uh, uh, in our class where we taught the students how to, how to do a, a marriage ceremony. And it was very quite comical because we used the first year students as a bride and a groom and, and, and all the bridesmaids and groomsmen and everybody standing there. And, and you know the age of uh, fast, quick Facebook pictures that go out. And all of a sudden, somebody took a picture of this girl up there getting married, and her mother got it on her Facebook, and she about freaked out. Oh, my. You got married, and you didn't even tell me. I wasn't even invited. I mean, it, we had a lot of explaining to do. Well, because of that, we also quit using a real person in the coffin, too. And uh, <laughs> we try to make it fun and exciting, but sometimes you have to deal with parents who really get anxious about what they see on Facebook. So uh, it, it's an interesting school because it's a three-year program with a one-year program that we have that goes into the local church for internship with the pastor. But that doesn't always work out either. We had an intern just a couple of years ago who went to the church to begin his internship. The pastor got up and introduced him and said, we have a young man here to work. I'm taking a one-year sabbatical, and he walked out the door. Uh, we have those kind of situations too. So we're training these young men and these young women to work in local churches, to be missionaries, to be evangelists, to be pastors. And uh, we right now have uh, 27 countries that have our students in them. We are expanding as far as I stepped down as the director last year, and my new role is going to be developing Word of Life in Vietnam, Cambodia, and in Indonesia. And what we're hoping to do is to get students from those countries coming and to go through our program and to go back and to make an impact in those countries for Christ. Now what does this have to do with you? We need teachers. Uh, our program, you can send a student to our program for less than $1,600 for the whole year. Room, board, studies, and everything. And the reason for that is our teachers pay their own way to come. And they give us one to two weeks. Some courses are 10 hours one week, some courses are 20 hours for two weeks. And in between, we put you in churches, we take you fishing to Corregidor, and we let you sleep uh, <laughs> after working you all week. Uh, if you're interested in overseas teaching, if you're interested in bringing your young people for an overseas experience in evangelism in a country where they can use their English, and we do not use translators, the teaching is all in English. Uh, you have one or two students sometimes who gets a little antsy about English, but we work around that. But if you're interested in an overseas experience in teaching, uh, if you would contact me, my email is Mike Foster at Word of Life or at WOL.org, O-R-G, Mike Foster at WOL.org. And uh, I will direct you to the people who will sit down and talk with you about 
uh, booking you to come. Our school starts uh, the 1st of July and goes to the last week of March. And uh, we appreciate being here. Uh, I'm through after this, so I get to sit back and just thoroughly enjoy and to be fed the Word of God, and we're looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and I uh, do encourage you to talk to Mike about going over and visiting. They really take good care of you there. If you can just get yourself over there, that's all you need to do. And uh, we really, uh, I neglected to introduce uh, the real strength of the ministry over there, and that is his wife, Marty, who is with us. Uh, so, Marty, uh, we're happy to have you with us. Now, our first message is by Roger Fankhauser, president of Free Grace Alliance. He's been president for, what, five, four, four years now? Uh, he's been uh, my pastor for, what? seven years now and um, he's going to shed a little light on the subject of the outer darkness so welcome Roger get uh, wired for sound. Uh, I do want to uh, yeah, plug Word of Life and uh, from a, a personal experience, uh, on the one hand, they will treat you very, 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 very graciously and very well. Um, it's a, a great place and quite right now, if you want to go on a mission trip, um, the uh, airfare is not all that bad. Uh, we're planning to take a group in uh, February and uh, the estimate we got for airfare is uh, 900 bucks. And uh, so the cost of going is not great. The facilities are great. The opportunities to serve are, are excellent. And so uh, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed my first trip there, and, and uh, I'm headed back. So uh, it, it really is a good time. And the, the students, uh, I was grinning all the time because about two-thirds of the students on the video were in my classes. and. You know, it's kind of fun connecting and watching them, and uh, a number of them we stay in, we've stayed in touch since uh, we've uh, left, so it's pretty exciting. I got to teach uh, contemporary issues, which is kind of interesting because it's hard enough teaching contemporary issues in your own culture. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, learning, it, it forced me to learn a little bit about their culture, and so um, I was talking to one of the, the directors of the school, and he said, don't even waste your time talking about marriage and divorce, and thinking, what do you mean, don't waste your time talking about marriage and divorce? Well, the Philippines, divorce is illegal. And uh, um, so what ends up happening is not divorce, but separations or annulments. And the separations, many times, it's we leave wife number one or husband number one, we join somebody else. And so you've got these pyramid scheme families, for lack of a better term. And so it's not ignore marriage but the the issues are much different so it's very fascinating to uh, be in other parts of of uh, the world um, okay you know the old saying a watch pot never boils the computers a watch computer screen never comes up give me just a second to pull this up we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the whole issue of um, uh, the Outer Darkness. Uh, Grant, would you hand me my Bible? Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, we, in talking about the Outer Darkness, I don't know if you've uh, uh, picked up on this, but it's a, uh, a heated topic. And uh, you will find all kinds of, of responses to it and you find all kinds of emotional levels of you know how people respond uh, to it and uh, I to be honest for a long time decided I'm just gonna stay in the dark about outer darkness and not really worry about it um, and then as we we're preparing for this uh, we thought uh, talking about the outer darkness would be a great topic to talk about and uh, figure that'd be a good way to you know start uh, things for the week, get things uh, stirred up and, and conversation going. And um, it really is a, an important issue. Uh, you'll find a whole range of views as we'll talk about. But first off, as we've said, um, there's a, a 
number of ranges of views of all kinds of topics and within of the Free Grace Alliance, that the heart of what we want all members to agree on is the covenant. Outside of the covenant, there's a lot of different issues. And so uh, this is one of those things that uh, somebody has asked, what's the official FGA position on the outer darkness? And I will give that to you. This is the official FGA position on the outer darkness. The scriptures speak of outer darkness. So any questions thus far? So we want to talk and, and just see what it says. And uh, we have to start with this idea that uh, uh, Matthew did not do us any favors. Have you ever looked at some passages in Scripture and, and one of your things on your to-do list when you get to heaven is go to the author of that particular book and go, why'd you do that? <laughs> well, Matthew is uh, interesting in this and that there's a number of things that Matthew uh, either does exclusively or... Uh, it's done very little outside of Matthew. And so you, you go, uh, why didn't you say something else? It would have saved us a lot of time. Uh, one is Matthew alone uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Well, that's not really a big deal, although you'll still find some people who dis differ with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. That used to be uh, you know, more of a battle than it is today. But essentially, Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven uh, as a synonym for kingdom of God. Um, but that's the only place it shows up is in, in Matthew. Well, then outer darkness shows up a grand total of three times, all of them in Matthew. And, and then you, you look at some of the words around it and you think, oh, well, I'm going to look up the word outer and see, you know, how that impacts the outer darkness. And the word outer, Matthew only uses three times and they're all in the phrase outer darkness. It's not used anywhere else in the New Testament. So that doesn't help us a whole lot. And then he uses, in one of the phrases, he uses the phrase, sons of the kingdom. And there's a question, is sons of the kingdom? Is that talking about believers or unbelievers? And Matthew alone uses the phrase, and he uses a grand total of twice. And so, you know, you can't dig, do a whole lot in uh, looking up where that phrase is used to see, you know, what the uh, issue is, whether it's a believer or unbeliever. And then the idea of weeping and, and gnashing of teeth, um, I'm trying to get the English language to pronounce that word correctly. It's gun ashing of teeth. But weeping and gnashing of teeth, six of the seven times that phrase is used is in Matthew. And so you know, we have all these different phrases that show up in Matthew and, and rarely elsewhere. The wedding clothes. Well, the wedding garments. Well, the word that's used for clothes, it's used eight times in the New Testament, seven of them in Matthew. Well, then I have as a note, <clears throat> linens, we know that uh, speaks of, of fine linens in Revelation 19. And uh, John didn't do us a whole lot of favor or help with that one because that shows up only five times in the New Testament and four of them in Revelation. So we get into all kinds of interesting uh, positions if we just simply try to do a word study around the various words that are used and, and discover that looking at the words themselves doesn't shed a whole lot of light on the, the whole issue of outer darkness. We have to look at how all the pieces fit together to come uh, up with a conclusion. So first thing we want to do is think about the range of views of outer darkness. These aren't necessarily all of the views, but you get an idea of the range. Uh, general agreement is that this is eschatological. It's in the future. Uh, <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, anyway, so general agreement, uh, but even with this, and most will say that it does deal with the wedding feast, but there are some who disagree with that. Um, the wedding feast, Gamma, shows up 16 times in the New Testament, 10 of them in Matthew. Uh, but there's one exception uh, that I'm aware of, I'm sure there are others, but uh, Stanley Toussaint uh, tries saying this isn't the wedding feast. He tries getting around the whole issue of when does the outer darkness occur, what is the setting, by uh, saying that it's not a wedding banquet, it's, it's just a large banquet of some kind. Uh, but I don't think that the word really supports that. When you look at um, the word gamos elsewhere, uh, it is used of wedding feast. Uh, there are a number of other words that are used for other meal settings and other dinners. And the verb form is used pretty much exclusively uh, for uh, marriage, getting married. And so we have this idea that uh, we have outer darkness and uh, the setting, at least in part, in some of these are deal with the um, wedding feast. 
And so we then look at the different views around this. One view, and probably the most common, and certainly the most common outside of free grace circles, is that uh, the outer darkness is hell. And it's fascinating when you read through different commentaries and different uh, writings on Matthew that uh, some of them just simply say, well, the outer darkness clearly refers to hell and on the go without really doing a, a study, and it's somewhat of an assumed position. Uh, that's where I was, was raised as a young Christian. Uh, the outer darkness is hell, that's where you go, and typically you know, the argument is you end up in the outer darkness if there's not enough works produced in your life, and depending on which camp you come from, it can either be because you lost your salvation or you never had it in the first place. And uh, you know, so that's, that's the easy view to find. People will, will hold to that. Um, a second view, uh, Marty Colley did an extensive work on this, and there are others who hold it. Uh, his explanation is this. It's a permanent, punitory, spatial experience for unbelievers, unfaithful believers, of being in the kingdom, but with severe limitations on what the unfaithful believer will be permitted to do. And he goes into all kinds of verbiage that uh, in the outer darkness, in his view, it's not only speaking figuratively of some sort of an experience, but it also means there are limits on where that unfaithful believer will be able to go in the new kingdom, uh, won't have access to the married city, the new Jerusalem, and he actually goes so far to say that the unfaithful believer, and don't ask me to explain it, but his words are that they are part of the body of Christ, but they are not part of the bride of Christ. And so you get, you get, you get some very, a wide range of, of views and uh, a third one, somewhat in between, uh, is that outer darkness is an exclusion from the joy of co-reigning with Christ. It's experiential. It's based on rewards, not location. It's not spatial. It's not dealing with heaven versus hell, but it's dealing with some aspect of uh, reward or lack of reward in the kingdom and specifically dealing with issue of will you reign in some position with Christ or not. But in this this view, uh, outer darkness, you, you are in the kingdom, but it's a degree of reward that is being talked about. Not, it's not a location. It's not being excluded from the kingdom. It's not being um, excluded from the presence of God, but the idea of, of uh, being excluded from the joy of co-reigning with Christ. And so in the, the process of working through all this, I think I started just with a traditional outer darkness is hell. Uh, because that was the easiest. That's what I was taught, and you don't have to think too much about the texts. But then, as I started digging into the text, I realized there's issues with uh, the timing and what's going on and, and uh, uh, how you explain the different characters in the accounts. And so I've come to the conclusion, my personal view, of uh, I, I agree with that third view, that it deals with exclusion from the joy of co-reigning with Christ, that ultimately the experiential part with it is where will we be in the, not where will we physically be in the kingdom, but what um, will we be reigning? Will, you know, he talks about uh, you'll reign over many cities, a few cities, and, and uh, so on. And so it's, it deals with reward. It does not deal with whether or not we're in the kingdom, and uh, it certainly doesn't deal with uh, justification issues, whether it's heaven or hell. Now, I can look out and I can see some of you going, oh, yeah, good. Some of you going, what? That's okay. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to convince you. I'm just here to share with you my findings and my conclusions, and I would challenge you to study it. It's a pretty fascinating study when you start digging and thinking and scratching your heads. They're not easy passages to deal with. And uh, so in the, the time we have remaining, um, I want to go through, do an extensive exegesis of all three of the main passages, and I think we break for the evening at 8.30 tonight. <laughs> I'll try to finish before then. Uh, obviously, in the time we have, I, you won't be able to cover everything and all the details, but hopefully enough information that you can uh, you know, see how I came to my conclusions. And if you disagree with me, that's fine. My challenge with anybody that disagrees with my position is you know, disagree with me, but base it on the scripture, not just because you disagree with me. But that's, that's where we want to develop everything we believe, everything we teach uh, in, uh, within our churches, within the Free Grace Alliance, and, and me personally. 
So a couple of things. We must first deal with the timing. Uh, most of us here agree with the, the view of uh, that we are now in the church. Someday in the future, uh, the rapture will come. Uh, the older I get, the more I root for the rapture. And uh, following the rapture will be a seven-year period of tribulation. After that, the new kingdom, uh, the millennial kingdom, will be ushered in on earth, followed by new heavens and earth. The Bema seat, where believers are judged for uh, reward, uh, occurs seemingly in heaven after the rapture, obviously before the return of, of Christ and, and the rest of us returning with him. I know that we will have received glorified bodies and changed bodies at that time because it says we will ride back on horses and that's the only way I'll get on a horse. <laughs> so there's, there's some question of whether the, uh, the wedding feast actually occurs in heaven following the Bema or whether it occurs at the beginning of the millennium on earth and I lean towards that second view that it seems to fit better out of Revelation 19 that the wedding feast uh, speaks of that initial period of of the millennium. Some take it as speaking of the entire millennium. I think that is stretching it. I think it's dealing with a period of, of uh, celebration at the beginning. Uh, so the positions that are assigned as far as reigning, not reigning, those already have been uh, assigned at the, the Bema and we'll experience those uh, at the beginning of the millennium. So that's kind of the big picture of, of where the, the pieces fit. We also need to be a, cognizant of the Bema seat, and I have a sneaky feeling if we were to talk about uh, what uh, the rewards and loss of rewards uh, at the Bema seat are, there'd be some uh, interesting discussions amongst us, because chances are there's different views on that as well. And so we know Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, uh, that word recompensed, when you just look at it in English, and if you dig into the Greek, you'll find out that recompensed means recompensed. And when you look at that, you realize that, is, that deals with a, a payment of some kind. And so when we, we look at that word, you think, well, is that initial salvation? How do we receive our salvation? It's a gift. This is recompense. This is some sort of, of payment, for lack of a better term. Uh, for his deeds in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad now very few of us in the free grace camp would have any problem with that first phrase and that's the idea of, of receiving rewards for faithful service here and now so what we do in our life as a believer as part of our sanctification most of us would agree that uh, there will be some aspect of positive reward that we would receive at the bema uh, but there's then that, that second word that is bad, or, or actually better, worthless. There's recompense for what we do that is worthless. And that's where we kind of scratch our heads a little bit. And so there's a wide range there as well. Some would simply say that uh, this idea of, of recompense for what is bad, that we will simply not receive a reward. And so, you know, if my life is mostly bad and I've got one or two good things, I get into heaven and I get three Tootsie Rolls for the good things I've done. I don't think that's really promised as a reward, but somehow I think chocolate should be involved in the rewards. <laughs> anyway, so we don't have any problem with, with that. And then, but I would not be, there would not be anything uh, regarding all the things that I did unfaithfully, whether it was things that looked good on the outside but done in the flesh, or whether it was things that were you know, legitimately bad you know, on any level. Uh, but the, the text simply says it will be recompensed whether good or bad. And some will argue that there's punitive damages and some pretty severe at the Bama. And so part of what we wrestle with is what is that bad at the, the Bama? I'm not going to answer that in full. Tired of listening to me, huh? <laughs> so I'm not, we're not going to deal with that whole aspect, but that's a question that we have to wrestle with in, in trying to figure out, at least in broad terms, what is the good or bad, and was there some sort of, of negative at the Bema? Uh, let me give you a, a sneak preview. I think that you know, there will be 
shame for some at the Bema. I think that there will be sorrow for some at the Bema because um, if we see Christ in our glorified bodies and we are aware of what we've done in this life, it certainly seems logical that we will ha have some sorrow for missed opportunities. And I think even more so for the person that has trusted Christ and so they're genuinely believers, they enter into heaven, but for big picture, they've wasted their life here and there will be some level of sorrow in heaven. And so I think there is some negative aspect of, of the Bema seat. I don't think that's permanent. You know, the sorrow is not a permanent state. We're not going to be in heaven sorrowful forever. There's a, you know, that time of, of evaluation, though I think that uh, we will face that. And so then, what is the recompense for bad? Well, we come to the three passages uh, dealing with uh, outer darkness. And so if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 8, turn in your phones to Matthew 8. <laughs> Some years ago in uh, uh, Sunday school class, I asked one of the people in class to read a passage. And, and the answer was, I can't. The battery died. <laughs> so in Matthew 8, this is the, the shortest of the accounts. Uh, where we deal with outer darkness, uh, we deal with uh, the centurion. Uh, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, f fearfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come out and heal him. Now watch the centurion, uh, watch his response. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word, my servant will be healed. Now, what does that show you about what he knows about Christ? He's got great faith in who Christ is and what he's able to do. And uh, he goes on, he says, I'm also a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So far, so good. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's very interesting. Notice what he says about the centurion. He doesn't say, I've not seen faith, but I've seen what kind of faith? Great faith. So it's speaking about the... the uh, extent of his faith, not the fact that he has faith in Christ, but just how, how profound his faith is, that he believes that Jesus will be able to do what is seemingly impossible, heal from a distance, and it speaks about what uh, he understands as, as a Gentile, what he understands about who Christ is. And so he, com he is commending his great faith um, that's demonstrated in this, this action. Well, then it says that they are reclining at the kingdom. Now, notice this, or reclining at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, when the kingdom begins, how many unbelievers will be in the kingdom? Zero. So if the wedding feast is at the beginning of the kingdom, and when he sees these people reclining at the kingdom, there are no unbelievers in the kingdom. They're, they are all believers. And he speaks of they'll come from east and west, which speaks about the global ministry of, of Christ, and recline at the table in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. So there's some connection between these people, the sons of the kingdom. If there are no unbelievers in the kingdom, just with that premise, what's the spiritual state of the sons of the kingdom here, believer or unbeliever? In the context, conclude that there are believers. We'll see later that that is supported by the other use of the word sons of the kingdom. And he says they'll be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, in Matthew 13, the only other use of the sons of the kingdom, Jesus is, is uh, explaining the parable of the soils. And he says this, And the field is the world, and as for the good seed... These are the sons of the kingdom, and the or wheat's and the tares, sorry. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. So on the only other use of sons of the kingdom in that particular place, believer or unbeliever? Believer. 
And so the, the conclusion we have to come to is either they're believers in both places or Matthew switches his use of the phrase sons of the kingdom has a different meaning in, in 8 than in 13. And without stronger contextual evidence, I find that um, improbable that a writer would use that phrase so rarely. I think he's speaking of the same thing. And so I, hold, I take that the sons of the kingdom are believers. And so what is being talked about is blessing position of, of blessing with, at the, the feast rather than identity of believer or unbeliever. So I, I think these are believers and uh, we are told a couple of things. One is they are cast out. Now when you hear the word cast out, what do you think of? Is that gentle or forced? It's forced, but the word really is it's widely used in the New Testament and uh, it can be meant, sent out and basically at the heart of it, it simply means move from point A to point B and you have to look at the context to decide how that is and where that is. And so this idea of being cast out, it isn't necessarily what you know, we so often think of, of picking them up and throwing them. I think it's a, a term used to emphasize that it is done uh, to emphasize what is happening to these people, but does not represent uh, necessarily that they are being cast into hell. It's real easy to think of that. Matter of fact, almost all the uses of this particular word are speaking of some other type of, of casting out. It is used uh, often for casting out of demons, but that's you know, obviously from here to there. That's a, a pretty strong term, but there are, much, uh, there are a number of other uses uh, that are, are less uh, strong. So all that simply means is being cast out, being cast into the outer darkness. It's simply moved into that place of darkness. Don't read into that word cast, that necessary judgmental concept that we often uh, think about, or at least I did uh, for so long. And then we get to the idea of weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is that? Well, yesterday, Cowboys won. I rejoiced. Last night, the Rangers lost. I didn't rejoice. But weeping and gnashing of teeth is it's an emotional response, that typically a response of, of sorrow um, when things don't go well. And I didn't weep and gnash my teeth over the Rangers losing. It wasn't that big of a deal. But uh, if you ever have an opportunity to be in uh, Israel or in the Middle East and you see a, a, a wedding, uh, a wedding, a funeral, <laughs> or something along that line, um, it, there's all kinds of emotion being expressed. When you go through and read through the scripture, you see the, the tearing of the clothes and, and all kinds of different strong emotional responses. You know, if you think of weeping and gnashing of teeth in a Western thought, it's like, oh, wow, what is this? If you think of an Eastern uh, perspective, it makes sense. That's a normal emotional response to when there's deep sadness or regret or sorrow for something. When we look at the, the word, it's only used eight times in all of the Bible. Um, Luke 13, 28 is the only one outside of Matthew. Twice, there is a connection of a furnace of fire and hell. And so in those cases, it seems pretty clear that the weeping and gnashing of teeth is in hell. But that leads to the question, does the response necessarily identify the location? And my uh, conviction is that's not the case. That weeping and gnashing, that phrase by itself does not mean that it is in hell. It just simply means strong remorse. And the context will tell you where that is and what it's about. Uh, so there are some uh, that I've read that, that actually do that. They say, well, see, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that's a response in hell. Therefore, this passage is speaking of hell. And that's not necessarily true. It simply means there's a similar strong emotional response of, of sorrow and sadness for what's going on. And the context has to tell you where. Well, then we get finally to the phrase outer darkness or the darkness outside. And as I mentioned earlier, outer, the only place it's used in the New Testament is in th these three verses. But it is interesting that it is used most often in the Septuagint in um, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, speaking of the outer court of the temple. Now, is the outer court a horrible place? No. No, but it is the 
outer court. And so it, it speaks of uh, a spatial event, but it isn't necessarily speaking of some place that is um, harsh and, and terrible. And so outer by itself doesn't really give us a whole lot of, of weight to think about. But then we get to the idea of darkness. And so here's where we get into trouble. So here's a question that I've, I've read and, and heard. Uh, what does darkness have to do with light? Therefore, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, what does darkness have to do with light? Therefore, this must be hell. It's not true. Can a, can a believer walk in darkness? Yes. yes. Now, that's a place of, uh, has nothing to do with our identity, but it has a pla it's a place of being in an uh, improper place in the, the spiritual walk. And so there's a range of meanings, even on the spiritual level, of what darkness means. Uh, there's another level that every one of us, even if we are spiritual, we walk in the darkness. How many of you have walked outside after sunset? <laughs> Not many hands. That's kind of scary. <laughs> it's okay. This is a safe place. <laughs> now, now, my point is that darkness sometimes is a physical darkness. And I take it in the, this phrase, the outer darkness, that it's a physical darkness, but he, he's making a point. But he's talking about that outer darkness. He's not talking about the place of darkness connected with Satan, connected with sin, and, and so on, but rather it's a, a, a space relative to the brightness of the wedding feast itself. And not speaking of hell. In fact, darkness is rarely used directly of hell. Uh, there is a reference in Jude that uh, seems to be the case, but rather it's dealing with physical darkness. And so my understanding, outer darkness, it's a place away from the greatest blessing, the wedding feast, imagery for the loss of joy corresponding to the loss of reward of reigning with Christ. So I'll leave that up there for a moment. It's a place away from the greatest blessing, the wedding feast, Imagery for the loss of joy corresponding to the loss of reward of reigning with Christ. Now it leads to completely different conclusions of what we do with the passages. If it's hell, it teaches one thing, we have one application. If it deals more with reward and loss of blessing, it deals with something else. I don't take it as strongly as uh, the other extreme view that it means we have no access ever into the holy city or that uh, that there are limitations on where we can go and so on but I do think it deals with uh, the extent or lack of extent of reward that a believer uh, will receive and that the weeping and raining that should be weeping and gnashing sorry weeping and gnashing should be temporary, that that is not the permanent state of how we are in heaven, but that is in dealing with that process of, of when we uh, uh, receive that reward and we understand uh, where our place will be throughout the, the kingdom. So the idea is, it's, you notice how the, you have the brightness in the middle, that, and then it, it gets darker as you go out. It, the outer darkness is more at the edge rather than in. And so um, it's, the imagery is that of a wedding feast, which is done in a wedding hall, which typically would be done at night. It would be brightly lit by all the candles and such within the, the facility. But what's it going to be as you get to the, the edges of that room and then get beyond that and get outside? It's going to be darker. And that outer darkness, I think, is speaking of that, um, he easily could have made a stronger reference to hell because he did in the context of weeping and gnashing twice talk about the furnace of fire. And so I think it's, he's speaking about you're going to be on the outside, not on the inside with the closest fellowship. The closest I could come to a, uh, a real life uh, example is uh, I love to go to co various concerts. One of my favorites is a traditional Christmas concert, and it's uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, a great Christian band. <laughs> well, maybe not. Well, one year, one of my friends says, I'll get the tickets. And uh, he worked nights, got online as soon as the tickets went on sale, and we had to suffer with second row center stage seats. Now, for somebody like me who loves you know, rock and roll and you know, I love listening to you know, great guitar solos and, 
Yeah, man, that was, that's, that's pretty close to heaven. Heaven's actually going to be better than that. But, you know, that, you're right there. You got right in the middle of all the lights and all the special effects. And, you know, it's pretty cool. You can watch the guy's hands as he's playing the guitar. And you can, you can see him as he's turning around. One of the keyboard players was the guy's wife. And you can, you know, you can watch him as he's turning around and making, you know, comments to his, his wife that nobody else can see. And going, that's pretty cool. Well, then we went another time. We went in Dallas, and we decided to wait till almost the last minute to get tickets. And so we were literally the top row in the very back of the arena. And I'm pretty sure the band was there. <laughs> Way down there. You know, and the lights weren't quite the same, and the sounds, they're a little bit different, and obviously I couldn't see all the details, and, and they wouldn't let you take binoculars in because they were afraid that the lasers would bounce off of the lenses and mess up people, so you couldn't even look, use, so it's kind of like this. Now, that's not a great illustration, but it kind of gives the idea of being, uh, you know, in a different spot. So I, I'm convinced that uh, it fits in this first passage dealing with... Um, outer darkness that is speaking about being on the outside, the darkness that is outside. It's not that you're outside of the kingdom, but you're outside of that immediate place of, of fest festivity and greatest place of blessing. And then it is a figurative picture of co-reigning with Christ and where we will be with, with him. Well, let's quickly look at Matthew 22, second use of outer darkness and see if my conclusions still work. So 22 begins with this. Jesus spoke to them again in parables. It gives us a clue that this is a parable. And says, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for a He had told parables with this kingdom of heaven is like back in chapter 13. And now he is introducing another one. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who has a, giving a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who have been invited to the wedding feast. And they were unwilling to come. And again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I've prepared my dinner, my ox and my, f and, and my fatted livestock are all butchered and everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized the slaves and mistreated them and killed them. So it's a picture of how Israel has rejected the invitation uh, in years past. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. These slaves went into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. Well, that creates a bit of a problem, doesn't it? And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. When the king came to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Well, the wedding feasts are sent out and rejected. Uh, seemingly, this idea of the king setting their city on fire looks forward to A.D. 70 when uh, Jerusalem is besieged by Rome and destroyed. And uh, then in the final invitation, you have the invitation of the good and evil. Now, how many of us qualify as good? None. But we read this and it kind of bothers us sometimes. Say, what do you mean? Invited the good and the evil. Well, in the context, the Jewish context, who would the Pharisees and who would the Jews think of as evil? Most everybody around them that weren't them. So you've got the, the prostitutes and the drunkards and tax collectors and all those kinds of things. And so the idea here is that you know, he's going both to those who are perceived as good and perceived as evil. We know theologically all of them are evil, but that's, that's not Jesus' point in the parable. The final invitation goes to all people of all kinds. And that's one of the things we see in the life of Jesus as he you know, spends time with the, the prostitutes. He spends time with the tax collectors. And we, he spends time with the, the socially unacceptable. And in the midst of that, the king discovers one improperly dressed man. So the question is, who is this man, believer or unbeliever? 
Well, those who hold that the outer darkness is hell imply that this is, the, this is an unbeliever. But there's a problem. He's at the wedding feast. Now, if the wedding feast is after the Bema and in heaven, that's a problem. Because how would somebody who's not a believer end up in heaven? If the wedding feast is after Jesus returns and at the beginning of the kingdom, we still have a problem because that means you got an unbeliever that snuck into the kingdom. How do you get there? That's a bit of a, of, a, of a problem to me. Then we have the question of are the wedding clothes provided or clothed themselves? And so some will argue that the wedding clothes uh, represent the righteousness of Christ, imputed righteousness, and will try to appeal to um, some who say that the king actually provided the wedding clothes. But uh, I don't think that fits the bigger picture of, of the New Testament. So we see in Matthew that the evidence in Matthew is it deals with the type of clothes, the wedding clothes, but Revelation teaches us much more about uh, what those clothes actually are and how the, the person became clothed in those clothes. So he calls them fine linen. And notice in Revelation 19.8, John says this, it was given to her to clothe herself. You see that? So who did the clothing? She did it herself. It wasn't clothes that were provided. It has clothing herself in fine linen, bright and clean. And then we have a very clear explanation of what these fine linens are. It says, this is the righteous acts of the saints. So is that dealing with imputed righteousness or is that dealing with the result of sanctification? Sanctification. The, imputed, the righteous acts of the saints are what we do as a believer after we've trusted Christ in this life. Faithful obedience to Christ deal, produces these righteous acts. So clothe herself, not in clothes that the king provided, but in clothes that she provided in the, her own righteous acts. And in this context of Matthew 19, we also have references to now is the wedding feast. So when we link these two passages together, it seems pretty clear that this man who was not clothed, I think is a believer because he is in the kingdom. And this issue of clothing or not having clothing is dealing with righteous acts. And so if the, if the fine linens that we wear is when we come back from Christ are uh, earned, if you will, by our righteous acts, and this man is effectively unclothed with those fine linens, what's that say about his faithfulness in this life? Nothing. It says it's not good. But, but it doesn't mean that he is an unbeliever. I think it's strong language, an extreme picture to make a, a point of the importance of being prepared and the importance of being faithful in life here and now, that it matters there and then. And so we come to that idea of of the believer, this man is a believer in the, the wedding feast, in the kingdom, but what he is dealing with is a lack of reward as a result of unfaithfulness here. If the wedding clothes, it's fine linen because of the righteous acts, there's not righteous acts with which to clothe himself. Now, some of the reform camp would say, well, see, there's no clothes, therefore he's a, he can't be a believer. That doesn't solve the problem of how do you get an unbeliever in the kingdom. And that, that to me is insurmountable. And that's how I ended up, really, that was the key thing that emphasized to me this outer darkness is a reward issue, not a, a justification, heaven or hell issue. So what about binding him hand and foot? Doesn't that sound pretty strong? Well, keep in mind, this is a parable, and he's painting a picture to make a point, and the idea is that bound hand and foot, and he's taken out, cast into the outer darkness, that he is in no position to be able to do anything to work his way back into that place of, of the, the greatest light within the, the wedding feast itself. And so I think he's using strong language again to make a point. Uh, we don't see anything uh, about binding hand and foot or some of the other phrases that show up as descriptive of, of hell one way or the other. You know, it's, it's figurative to make a, a strong point. Jesus' strong point is here's a man who's completely unclothed, no righteousnesses, and so he will not be allowed to enter into the closest 
most blessed place within the wedding festivity, there in the, the central hall within the bright lights. Instead, he is at the outer place, the outer darkness, outside of that brightest light. Not hell, but just at the, extre- at the edges, if you will, of the light from that festivity. And he, he can't work his way back in. And again, we have outer darkness, weeping, and gnashing of teeth. And then I've got about three minutes to do the last parable, Matthew 25. So I won't read the whole passage. I'd encourage you to to read it on your own. But we're given uh, the picture of three people who are given talents. Now, uh, one is five, one, two, one, one talents. If all three are referred to as his servants and all three are given talents, What does that tell us about the spiritual condition of all three? Are they the same or different? It implies that they're the same. You know, there's something about, you know, being given a talent that speaks to the identity of who these servants are. So he calls them his own slave, and they're all given talents. Well, it doesn't make any sense for that to be salvation because they're not all all given the same amount. There's no such thing as this much salvation and this much salvation and this much salvation. But how about opportunities for service? Is there this much opportunity for some, this much for others, this much for others? I'll pick on Gray School of Theology a little bit. They're out here. They're literally worldwide in reaching out to people, proclaiming a free grace message, teaching salvation, and their opportunities are, are global. They have a whole bunch of opportunities in which to be faithful. Uh, There's some of us who are pastors in small churches in small cities, and our opportunity to be faithful is here. What does God call us to be faithful to? Whatever opportunities he's given us. And it's not just in teaching ministry, it's any ministry. And so, you know, if you have a gift of helps, are you faithful in whatever the small ministry is or the big ministry is? And so God gives different talents, different gifts, different opportunities, different ministries to people. And so I think that's part of what this different level of talents is. But he gives each of them talents. Does he give spiritual gifts and opportunities for real spiritual service to unbelievers? No. And so you, you get into a bit of a mess if you try saying, well, the first two are believers, but the third one is not. Because they're all called his servants. They're all given talents, which tells me that the spiritual condition of all three are the same. It's not natural abilities because God doesn't reward us for natural abilities. His reward is uh, service or faithfulness. And it also tells me that uh, these talents are speaking of believers because the talents produce talents. It produces things of the same kind. Now, you could say that of natural gifts as well, that that would produce natural things. But the emphasis is the first two are, are commended for what they produce using the talents. The third one is not. So I, I come to the conclusion that all three are believers, which, you know, that's, that last one's a little tough. But again, Jesus is using strong language to make a strong point about the importance of being prepared and being faithful in, in serving. So I take the talents as referencing opportunities for service as, as believers, different quantities for different believers. So the first two both receive the same commendation, well done. Um, side note. Can you imagine how cool that's going to be if we are one of those who hear from the lips of Jesus, well done? That's pretty amazing. Yeah. There's a song by Mercy Me, I can only imagine. Well, I can't even imagine that. Their reward, they'll be in charge of many things. That's where we get the idea of, of this idea of... Um, Outer darkness is failure of ability to to reign. We're not going to be in charge of many things. With a third one, very harsh rebuke. Well, why so harsh? Because he was an unfaithful servant. And it wasn't that day-to-day sin that the person struggles with. Uh, Let me take an unofficial poll. How many of you have sinned within the last week? Okay. How many of you want to tell us what it was? (laughs) I don't think he's talking about that because he, there, there is no return on his investment. This is ongoing unfaithfulness, not that random act of unfaithfulness that all of us struggle with. 
This is an ongoing lifestyle of unfaithfulness because there's no return on his investment. I remember Jesus even told him, says, you could have put it in the bank and earn interest. Can't do that very well now. It's not going to get too much interest. But, you know, the, that's the idea is it's so harsh because this is a lifestyle of unfaithfulness of one of his servants. And so why is it taken away? It's because he's dealing with how unfaithful the person was. Now, who is this? We get back again to the outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth, exact same phrase as we've seen before. So we see that, that this is unbeliever, that, or excuse me, a believer that God s says, you've been habitually unfaithful as a result not only is there no reward, but even the opportunities, the, the thanksgiving, the reward is spread out amongst others. Now, will this person be in heaven? Assuming that I'm correct and that this is a believer, will he be in heaven? Yes. Will every tear be wiped away one day? Yes. Will he enjoy being in heaven? Yes. But nonetheless, there's still you know, a strong rebuke from Christ at that time of the Bema seat when we answer for what we have done, good or bad, and for the person who has habitually been unfaithful in the service, it's very strong rebuke. And that's, I think that's Jesus' point. It matters how we live here and now. It's not just getting in. As great as our salvation is, as great as our, he says there's more. I want you to be faithful. I want you to serve me. I want you to follow me. And on the one hand, you have positive rewards as not only by grace do I give you everything you need for salvation, but I, I love you so much when you do what's right, I'm going to reward you. But the flip side is, he says, man, when you take advantage of me and, and um, you walk in unfaithfulness, there's no reward, and even that what you have will be taken away. Not a salvation, but it's a great period of rebuke. But it's not permanent. Where we reign in the kingdom, that will be permanent. But this idea of the remorse and the, the emotional response, that is not. So my summary, outer darkness, I don't see it as hell. I can't, I have more problems trying to take that view and fit in the details. Granted, no matter what view you hold, there's some things you have to wrestle with in those passages. Secondly, it's a relative darkness compared to the full light enjoyed in the feast. It's not... Uh, not the darkest darkness. It's not the darkness of hell. It's not the furnace of fire. It simply is the darkness outside. And relative to the brightness of the feast, being outside of that, that festive hall is, is dark. It's figurative. It's a parable. and deals with loss of joy corresponding to the loss of reward of reigning with Christ. It's exclusion from that wedding feast, which I take at the beginning, but it's not exclusion from the kingdom. It's still in the kingdom. And I believe it's temporary remorse. That's not the permanent state of the unfaithful believer. And I think with just a, a minute, if, it's, if I'm wrong on the remorse being temporary, what's heaven like? If remorse is permanent... That doesn't sound like how God has described being in his presence. But there is a very strong reality that the believer can experience remorse, particularly at that time of the Bema seat when we're being evaluated for what we've done, whether good or evil. But I don't see it as permanent. Finally, the strong terminology emphasizes the seriousness of our unfaithfulness. So a couple of questions. Which believer should fear the outer darkness? Well, not... I'll call him Joe Believer, who kind of struggles through life, and, and, you know, the walk is like this. That's most of us. He's not talking about normal believer. I don't think the outer darkness is for the normal ups and downs and dealing with sins and confessing of sins and being, you know, learning of areas and so on. I think he's talking about the habitual, unfaithful believer who basically skates through life, if you will, uh, never serving, never being obedient. Where does this fit in free grace teaching? I think it fits you know, right in the middle of it. Because free grace teaching, as I understand it, my salvation is based on what Christ has done for me. I receive eternal life by believing in Jesus as the Son of God who died and was raised from the dead. My security is based on what Jesus and the Father and the Spirit have done for me. 
John tells us that we are in the hands of Jesus, we're in the hand of the Father, and then when you tack on to that the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that's a pretty good grip. And I think it speaks of the greatness of, of Christ's faithfulness and, and um, the promises of God, and that even if in the middle of that grip, I'm doing everything I can to try and wiggle out of it and not walk in faithfulness and obedience, he still hangs on to us. That's grace. That's grace. Never gives us permission to live in sin. Never gives us permission to choose to live that lifestyle. But I think the reality is that that also speaks greatness about the, how profound God's grace is for the believer. Now, we do want to beware legalism. I've encountered people who this doctrine scares them because it's been hammered over them. Uh, are you going to be in outer darkness? That's not the right teaching. I think it is right for us to tell people about reward and loss of reward and uh, to let people know about the consequences of, you know, of ongoing unfaithfulness. But we can't turn it into a legalistic, oh no, am I going to be in the outer darkness or not? Challenge people to walk in the light. It can't be fear-based. Honest, yes, but not fear. Our primary call is to walk in the light. Uh, when you read in John, when we talk about, or First John, talking about confession of sin, that's in the context of walking in the light. And when we realize we've sinned, it's pick ourselves up and move on and keep going. And the challenge is walk in the light, but neither does the scriptures nor our Lord ignores those believers who choose to stay in the darkness, who choose to walk unfaithfully. And so it is a, it is a serious warning. There's real consequences for unfaithfulness. But I think... It, I think it fits with the grace of God and that even the unfaithful believer, even though he will receive negative uh, recompense at the Bema seat, will still be in the, his presence forever. That's amazing. Thank you. I planned that just right. There's no time for questions. Yeah. So we uh, now have a break from 2.30 to 2.45. Following that, there are uh, five work.